After the tone, please state your name followed by the pound sign. So, well, your line has been muted. Uh, Kurt Spaulding as well as Beth Card from the state who are also great partners to the city of Boston. You know, what I really wanted to highlight in this is, as was mentioned in the introduction, I spent a lot of time on climate preparedness and the city's energy policy and what we're going to do as our city becomes more and more, more vulnerable to climate change. But as John pointed out in his presentation, our city has really been shaped by our waterways. We have a very, very protected harbor here in the city of Boston, which gave rise to a thriving marine and, and maritime industries. And while we've really thrived as a result of that, we haven't necessarily always been the best stewards of it. Uh, we've since then spent billions of dollars, as John mentioned, on our Deer Island wa wastewater treatment plant, as well as the combined sewer separations. And now, I mean, just a few decades ago, the Charles River, the Boston Harbor, some of the dirtiest in the nation, uh, those who fell in were frequently advised to go see medical treatment. So this investment that we're seeing is now paying off. We're seeing companies, even like GE, that are coming to the city of Boston, placing their headquarters in areas where people just a handful of decades ago wouldn't have wanted to be because it may have smelled bad or just nobody else was there. Now, as a result of these investments that we're making, our waterfront and what has really shaped Boston's history is making us thrive again, and we're really, really proud of that. However, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and some of these non-point sources are going to be some of those challenges that we're going to need to address, whether it's through green infrastructure or otherwise. But those are all further compounded by some of the challenges that we have around Boston as it relates to sea level rise and other effects of climate change. So one effort that my department, the Environment Department, is really responsible for leading is something called Climate Ready Boston. This is a study that goes block by block, building by building, neighborhood by neighborhood in the city of Boston, and takes all the best data on sea level rise as well as climate change effects and translates that into dollar figures. Helps us understand not only from what a sense of what's at risk from an asset perspective, but also what are the productivity losses that are associated with these consequences as well. And so that means what if our electric grid goes down? What if our transportation grid our, our transportation infrastructure goes down. What are the productivity losses that are associated with that? To put things in perspective, by the end of the century, 20% of Boston to acreage will be within the floodplain. That's about 12,000 buildings, about $80 billion worth of market value. And so the Walsh administration is very, very committed to coming up with a plan to protect these assets. And we knew that in order to make that happen, we needed to work with our partners, not just across city departments and city hall, but also with the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, but also with our regional wastewater and water treatment agency, the water resources, the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, as well as with our partners at the state. So we use all the data from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and their flood projections and incorporated that into our models. We use Boston Water and Sewer Commission data from a storm perspective, incorporate that into our models. And ultimately now we're moving into the next phase where we're deciding how can we best protect the city given what we know on this neighborhood by neighborhood basis. And one of the big recommendations that came out of that is that we needed to form a committee made up not just of the city, but also our industry partners and our utilities so that if we do have one challenge that whether it's our sewer system, our steam system, our electric system that fail and then impact the other ones, that we have standards that are together and we have people that are constantly in contact to address those issues instead of having people just pointing fingers at each other. And so by doing this analysis and coming up with these plans, Boston continues to be leaders on these issues as it relates to climate adaptation. We've got very, very broad goals on the mitigation side as well, which certainly will, will also impact a lot of this work as it relates to how we can best address pollution in the city of Boston. I'll talk about that just very briefly. The city of Boston has very, very aggressive goals that match those of the state. We aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 
25 percent by 2020, 80 percent by 2050. This puts us on the vanguard of this work, and a big part of that has to do with addressing how our buildings are constructed, how they deal with wastewater, how they deal with waste, but also how they deal with energy. And Obviously, some of our largest users of energy in the city of Boston are not just our buildings, but our infrastructure, particular transportation systems as well. And so it's really, really important that we continue to work together as we address many of these issues. But we also want to make sure that we're engaging our our partners and our residents as we do this work. And so we've got a program called Green Innovate Boston. This is our main initiative to try and educate all of our residents on issues, whether they're greenhouse gas emissions, wastewater, stormwater, how to live more responsible and sustainable lifestyles. And that's, as John mentioned, something that I think that we still have a long way to go on. I think most people uh, you know, outside of this room they just kind of expect when it rains for the water to go somewhere, and it's not something that comes into their mind. By helping educate them and help them understand how they can use their own private property to alleviate some of these strains on the system, particularly as we're expecting so much more stormwater here in the region, is a crucial part of that strategy. Just to put that in perspective, even here in the Northeast, just over the past few decades, we've seen a 70% increase in precipitation. We're expecting that to get even worse. Uh, and as that's combined with the city of Boston and how vulnerable we are to sea level rise, because as John mentioned, so much of our city is based on fill. And that fill is really just built in the 1800s to where the sea level was then. But the sea hasn't kept that promise and it's continued to rise. And so now we're a very, very vulnerable city to these challenges. And if we have 20% of the city underwater, that water has to go somewhere or that pollution is going to invade all of those uh, buildings that are in the floodplain. So with that, looking forward to your questions, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Chief Blackman, for coming in. Um, next up, Beth Card currently serves as the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, a position that she's held since March of 2015. In this role, she leads agency efforts pertaining to regulatory reform and manages priority initiatives related to air, waste, and water. Prior to her current post, in November 2011, she first joined the agency as the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Water Resources. Among her priority projects, Beth has been coordinating the implementation of revised water management regulations following the Sustainable Water Management Initiative, an effort that's geared towards balancing competing human needs for water and the long-term health of Massachusetts rivers and streams. Prior to joining MassDEP, Beth was the Director of Water Quality, uh, the Water Quality Division, excuse me, for the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, and in 2009, EPA New England presented Beth with a prestigious Environmental Merit Award for her work on the development of the Northeast Regional Mercury TMDL. Beth has also served as the co-chair of Aqua's Legal Affairs Task Force since 2006. Beth holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of New Hampshire and a JD from the Massachusetts School of Law. Without further ado, please welcome Beth Cards. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Massachusetts. Uh, it's so great uh, to have all of you here, uh, both uh, those of you who came from other places across the country and those that call Massachusetts home. I'm so thrilled that you have all assembled here uh, to discuss and share your ideas about this very important topic. And on behalf of Commissioner Suberg, I want to welcome you. Um, also, very special thanks to New England Interstate, um, Ron Poltak and staff, Kristen, uh, as well as EPA, um, Kurt, you and your team, as well as the folks from EPA headquarters. Um, thank you all so much for convening the conference. Um, Non-point source pollution uh, really gives us an example of a, a, a really thorny dilemma, a prickly problem, um, caused by the fact that we all want to use our very special and precious water resources, and that these resources are common to all of us. And each and every one of us as individuals and as communities contribute to the problem. We contribute to the non-point source problem every single day through the way we use our roads, through the way we manage our homes, our lawns, um, to our agricultural uh, practices, and so um, and our stormwater management approaches, and we are really only 
really beginning to grapple with um, changing our actions and our infrastructure to protect the water resources that are being at, uh, impacted. So many states, um, including Massachusetts, uh, for so many of us, the problem is made worse by the fact that there is dense development where there are fewer natural resources to be shared by more people. Uh, in Massachusetts, we rank 45th out of 50 states in surface area, um, yet our population is 6.5 million people, which places us 15th in population, so there's a lot of us and, and not that much room. Um, and more than 75% of our population resides in the eastern one-third of our state. So this really confounds the issues we have, not only with management of water pollution problems, but water quantity issues as well, which you might be surprised to hear me say in Massachusetts if you're from the western part of the world or western part of the, the country, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The urban development and human activities related to this population density guarantees that we will generate a lot of stormwater and that our stormwater runoff will likely be polluted. Statewide, more than half of our assessed surface water areas are impaired, at least in part due to stormwater or non-point sources of pollution. Um, and I know that non-point source pollution is a major challenge for water quality for each of you in the room today, otherwise you wouldn't be here uh, to talk about it. And you all face your own unique challenges that come with uh, the, the resource that you are trying to manage. And because of that, um, I, you know, like John, share, share the idea that, you know, sharing experiences, lessons learned, um, it, it's helpful to municipalities, it's helpful to state agencies too, and it's helpful for all of us, local, state, and federal, to make sure we're on the same page about what works and what doesn't, and what are we going to accomplish with the, the, the resources that we have, and by resources I mean the money. Um, and all of these, uh, so many solutions can be quite costly, so we want to make sure that they work. And so it's great to have the opportunity to talk about that and share ideas um, in a forum just like this so that we can continue to make progress. And so we ha while we do have, um, as I've shared, a lot more work to do uh, here in Massachusetts, we've also made some great progress. And that's um, part of the great thing about being able to be a host state is you get to brag a little bit about what's been going on here at home. And so I'm, I'm happy to have that chance to do that. Um, as we develop and implement our non-point source program in Massachusetts, DEP, certainly uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, certainly plays a lead role, but we have to collaborate so closely with other agencies, other state agencies first and foremost um, here in the Commonwealth. So we work with our offices of coastal zone, zone management, our Department of Conservation and Recreation, Department of Fish and Game, Department of Agricultural Resources, all of us. Um, within the, uh, the Secretariat have to share ideas um, so that we don't either uh, go in different directions or come at, at cross purposes, and, and we work very hard at doing that. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we have tried very hard, especially the, the baker Polito administration has worked very hard on working closely with municipalities as we're, we're embarking on these important efforts. And I want to pause for a minute um, to talk about the great work that municipalities do here in Massachusetts, and I'm not just um, talking about it because I'm outnumbered by John and Austin up here on the panel, but really um, we do believe that municipal officials and municipalities are at the forefront of implementing environmental programs here in Massachusetts. Um, they are public water suppliers. They are our wastewater treatment plant operators in Massachusetts. They are responsible for implementing the Wetlands Protection Act. They are leading the way on recycling programs. Municipalities are way out in front of where we as state regulators are, and we thank, for, thank them for that. And in addition to the regular programs that they administer every day this summer, um, our, our municipalities here in Massachusetts, we're, we're dealing with a couple of other things. One. We had a drought. We've been in a drought in Massachusetts for five months now, which is, is relatively new for us. It doesn't happen that often. Um, so we were uh, faced with challenges associated with public water suppliers, municipalities calling us and saying, I think I've got about a week left in my reservoir. What do I do? Um, but they're the ones out there um, keeping an eye. And besides doing a rain dance, you know, you have to do other things like finding ways to make interconnections or utilize other sources that might not otherwise be available. Um, so these are the types of challenges that municipalities are faced with. Um, we've also been working very hard, um, including in partnering with the City of Boston and other municipalities statewide on lead in schools. We all have learned so much from what happened in Flint, Michigan, and we're still learning more and more. And in Massachusetts, we had the opportunity to begin a program where um, MassDEP was uh, working with public schools, um, offering sampling for lead 
copper um, and reporting the results of those sampling and then working together with those public, public school systems on identifying solutions when um, they're finding levels of lead and copper that exceed action levels um, statewide. And this is a program that still uh, is ongoing and we've learned a lot um, from cities like the city of Boston about the best way to do that um, and, and how to, to collect and utilize that information. So municipalities um, get, get gold star from us here in Massachusetts and, and for another reason too related to the reasons why you're here. Um, they are also looking at ways to forge different types of innovative partnerships um, to help tackle our stormwater challenges. Back in 2012, a few of our forward-thinking municipalities launched the idea of a regionalized stormwater management initiative whereby a group of towns would share resources and costs to address stormwater uh, challenges within their own community. They also sought some help to help meet their compliance requirements under the, the Massachusetts MS4 permit. Um, and the 2012 effort resulted in our first regional stormwater coalition, which then consisted of a dozen communities in central Massachusetts. That central Massachusetts stormwater coalition has now grown to well over 30 towns. And based on the success, we now have five other regional stormwater collaboratives um, throughout the Commonwealth, where these communities are, are working together to do things like share GPS equipment and reporting, um, developing reporting and tracking tools, using a shared online library of outreach materials that can be customized um, and branded by each community. Um, and they're now looking into ways to uh, enter into regional contracts for shared services, such as laboratory analytical service, services and, and other efforts. So um, these, these, these towns really, really have done it and they're a great model. Um, Massachusetts DEP has had the opportunity to offer them a little bit of funding, not much, but a little bit to help keep them going as well as some logistical support and we're just so thrilled um, by their success. In addition, we've also helped to marry the work that the regional stormwater coalitions have done with one of our leading engineering colleges, the Worcester uh, Polytechnic Institute, to bring additional um, people power um, and problem solving ideas to the work that they're doing. But this model of the stormwater coalition has just been um, a, a real success story. And I know as we move ahead and in, in the years ahead, uh, we'll continue to learn from the work that these municipalities are doing. Lastly, uh, in Massachusetts at DEP, we are developing a web-based tool um, that will support the development of the nine element watershed-based plans in all of our communities. Our watershed-based plan tool, uh, which you'll learn about uh, in a session that Jane Pierce is presenting on on Wednesday morning, um, will assist communities and advocates with watershed planning and grant uh, proposal development. It uh, will help guide where do we want to make investments, where do, we, where do the resources and the problem line up, and, and what is the best path forward. And it will also provide fundamental information and support of stormwater management plans that are required um, for the MS4 permit in Massachusetts. So this is just a flavor. I know um, for DEP, we have a few folks um, who are able to participate in the conference, and I know they will be taking notes and uh, learning from the rest of you. And so really, I just want to thank you very much for being here and for sharing your ideas and look forward to a successful conference. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, next up, Kurt Spaulding, Regional Administrator of EPA New England, has extensive experience in the environmental protection field as an advocate, a policy analyst, and an administrator. For almost 20 years, he served as Executive Director of Save the Bay in Rhode Island, a nationally recognized 20,000 member environmental advocacy and education organization. There he helped build an advocacy and education program that assisted to restore the bay and which educates 15,000 children per year. He also oversaw the construction of the Save the Bay Center at Fields Point in Providence, Rhode Island. Winning the Phoenix Award for Development of the Save the Bay Center is a highlight of Kurt's leadership tenure. But according to, according to Kurt, getting a green infrastructure project permitted on a brownfield back in 2003 is one of his greatest achievements. Since joining the EPA leadership team in December 2010, Kurt has been leading a holistic approach to finding environmental solutions in New England. He has emphasized efforts in restoring and improving resilience for New England's iconic waters such as Cape Cod, Lake Champlain, the southern New England coast, Long Island Sound, and Great Bay. He has also been a champion for New England communities. Urban revitalization is a priority for Kurt, and through investments in brownfields, super fun site cleanups, and healthy community initiatives, Successful revitalization has come to fruition in places like Lawrence, Massachusetts, Waterbury, Connecticut, and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Kurt has been heavily engaged in adaptation planning efforts 
around climate change in New England and holds his bachelor's degree from Hobart College and an MPA from SUNY at Albany in New York. It is my honor to introduce Kurt Spaulding. Yeah, somebody better shorten that. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and, and thank you, uh, my other presenters. Uh, John, there's a point about where we are being on the high ground. I saw some climate change uh, projections of where the water will go, and I guess Boston will try to return to its former state as sea level, uh, sea level rises until, until, of course, Boston does his job along with everybody else to try to adapt to all of this. But again, thank you very much. Um, great to be here. Uh, thank you, Nui Pick, for putting this on. John, I'm sorry, uh, all of us here, we're very pleased to, to be here and, and, and with you. So it's a pleasure to be here in Boston today. We have representatives from tribes. I saw some tribal friends here. I'm so glad they're here. Um, <laughs> territories, EP, EPA staff across the country. This is an important topic, especially important here in New England. A region that is heavily protected in uh, protecting our water resources. Uh, we range from an urban area to coastal, mountainous, agricultural, rural. We have it all. But again, it is really all about our waters here in New England. In New England, our iconic waters make this a very special place to live from the north to the south. Casco Bay, wonderful place, an estuary of national significance. To Lake Champlain, some argue it's a great lake like the other Great Lakes. Back to the coast of Cape Cod, it's where it all began in this country, is, is at Cape Cod. Of course, Narragansett Bay, where I spent most of my career trying to restore the bay, and, and then, of course, that great inland sea, as it used to be, Long Island Sound. These places all struggle with nutrient overloads or too much nutrients, warming waters, rising seas, you name it, they deal with it. All three places have large watersheds that need protecting from the very top to the very bottom. And these systems are in trouble to some degree, threatening the economies that depend on them. All of them depend on a complex system of economic, social, cultural, environmental uh, values. All, it's, it's too short to say that New England depends on the vitality of these systems. So in the past, or in the recent past, really, it's been a recent time, I think John's slideshow is fantastic because it showed what can happen over a relatively short period of time. Um, but in the most recent time, we've seen great progress in protecting some of our iconic waters in New England. Boston Harbor is a national success story. One of the celebrations of this agency, or one of the things we celebrated when we celebrated our 40th anniversary, it was perhaps the most polluted harbor in the country. So today, it celebrates some of the cleanest urban beaches in the world. The Charles River. Um, if you go to a Red Sox game, you'll hear them sing, um, Love That Dirty Water. In fact, there's a TV show in Boston called Love That Dirty Water. Of course, you know where it comes from. It comes from a song by the Stand uh, Standells. They were singing about the Charles River. Uh, well, right now, the Charles, or this summer, the Charles hosted swimming, swimming competitions. And I think we'll probably see a day with some beaches open. But if you go out there today, you'll see people paddleboarding, kayaking, doing contact use. My bay, Narragansett Bay, was horribly polluted. Today, uh, the nutrients are down to a level approximately 1,900. We had a humpback whale breach off of Wickford. We have dolphins swim up the bay routinely. On Saturday, I was returning uh, on a vessel that's sailing up the bay with some friends. A couple seals popped out to visit us in the middle of the Providence River. Nobody would have thought that was possible. But let's be fair about all of these. These were kind of straightforward problems when you talk about wastewater plants and controlling the flow from point sources. We cleaned up Boston Harbor pri primarily with a big enforcement action. That, uh, John outlined it, but of course when they built the big sewage plant on Deer Island and then moved the outfall out to Mass Bay, it did great things for Boston Harbor. Darragansett Bay was a good story. We had an enormous fish kill on the bay and the legislature then mandated a 50% reduction in nutrient loadings from the wastewater plant. So each wastewater plant put a nutrient limit in, and voila, we got a 60% reduction in, in nitrogen, and, and good things have happened since. I wish it was that easy when it comes to the rest of the iconic waters in New England, but it's just not. Um, to restore 
Lake Champlain and the waters of Cape Cod will probably need to affect pollution reductions across thousands of non-point sources and discharges, some as small as a farm or a single house. This requires a, a much different approach, an approach you all know well, one that actively engages local communities and enlists the public in solving these problems. This must be much more of a community conversation. This new picture requires something I talk about a lot with my team at Region 1. It requires whole system thinking. It requires a watershed approach that Beth talked about, and I want to congratulate the Commonwealth on leading the charge in this kind of work. But most of all, it requires creativity and leveraging partnerships, a really different kind of way of thinking when you think about lawyers, enforcement, court schedules. That does, these two things don't always mix that well. Now, most of you here today have recently updated your non-point source management plans, which you do indeed focuses on watershed-based solutions and have highlighted your achievements and success stories. The approach works at the whole, uh, looks at the whole ecosystem and, and looks at sustainability and, and how you're going to advance that in, in managing or affecting change on these water bodies. We need that kind of approach. I use a term all the time called emerging conditions, and getting ourselves looking out and looking beyond the immediate, but looking on at what's coming. Obviously, the emerging condition of climate change, it's more than emerging at this point, it's, it's with us, but it keeps emerging and emerging. You have to keep looking at it and looking at it again and again. Next, and I guess a lot of you know, and Beth talked about our municipalities and our mayors and our common councils, our city councils, our select boards here in, in Massachusetts. Well, they're all struggling with very tight budgets, and this budget problem, the structural deficit problem, continues to plague our public sector in ways that are deep and hard to deal with. Um, now, the management plans you, you've done often look at local solutions. There are hundreds of national success stories, examples where we see how this kind of approach works. Um, look at Westlake in Iowa. Since 1996, EPA has partnered with their state departments, the Ag Department, um, and others to inv inv invest in best management practices, things like planting perennial vegetation along banks, implement rotational grazing at, with farmers in the watershed, all to get to water quality improvement. I mean, we know these things in this, this room. These kinds of stories tell us how partnerships can be powerful and work in, in very strong ways but most importantly, leverage the resources to get environmental results. Many of these stories start with 319 funding, that very important funding that people talk to me all the time about at the state level. More 319 money, please, more 319 money. Of course, they complain that once we have a consent decree or, or some kind of mandated improvement, 319 money is difficult to use. But then again, it's so important to get things going. Here in New England, our water resources, as I said, drive economy, tourism, recreation, environmental health. It is who we are. So over the past couple of years, EPA New England has been looking at these challenges, facing water systems, our big water ecosystems, uh, with our state and local partners, a true collaborative effort. Our partnerships on these issues are the glue that holds solutions together because these are local places that need local solutions and they'll only be effective if they sustain local economies. So a couple of examples that I'll just go through very quickly. The Lake Champlain TMDL, I hate the TM, nobody knows what a TMDL except people in this room, so publicly I like to think of it as an initiative for Lake Champlain. And of course another, we've got to change this title, Beth, Cape Cod 208. 208? I know you do. <laughs> so does everybody in this room, although the younger ones may not. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't get the joke, you're too young. But the, the, the bottom line is we've, we've initiated two very holistic approaches to two of New England's most iconic waters. Uh, the example, these are examples which not only in, illustrate how we need to embrace the complexity of what we do, but find innovation behind the solutions. We use the authority we have, which in some cases under the Clean Water Act is not that significant, um, but we can use that Clean Water Act in creative ways to empower strong local engagement and solutions. It's, in, it's important to note that 
the nuts and bolts of our programs. Other programs that aren't highlighted as much as quote, the Clean Water Act, the National Estuary Programs, 319 grants, and other smaller pieces of what's been added to our repertoire of tools have been very effective to get things done. It's really important that we use all, every tool we have, that we look at our toolbox, we do engagement, we, we um, encourage solutions that will save our resources. Um, there's a term I use to describe this with my team in Region 1. It's called latent capability, latent capacity. There's a lot of capacity and capability out there that's latent. It's not being used. Can we get to it? Can we figure out ways to empower it? So let's go to the Lake Champlain. You should know where it is. If you don't, I'm not going to tell you. You just don't know New England. Actually, it's wedged between New York and Vermont. Um, it's rural. It's mountainous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it has major challenges. It's an agricultural landscape, small farms, large farms. I learned long ago Vermont loves their small farms. And this is a place that really tries to protect their agriculture character. Uh, unfortunately, all these small farms, with all due respect to my federal partners, have been incented sometimes to grow where they shouldn't, add more head when they shouldn't, and of course leaves more nut nutrients going into the lake. Um, three quarters of the segments of Lake Champlain do not meet Vermont's water quality criteria for phosphorus, some by a wide margin. But to really get at this, you should visit northern Lake Champlain in the summer and see that nobody's going in the water. No one could go near the water because of blue-green algae blooms. And now they are depressingly regular and even predictable for the areas, some of the best recreational areas of Lake Champlain. We finalized the TMDL for Lake Champlain. It sets targets for 12 lake segments, subdivides these targets among four major sectors um, that contribute. So this is a very intense localized analysis. Um, it includes all the sources, wastewater treatment plants, about 5%. Of course, our friends in the legal community like to tell us we have to take those down to you know, as minimum technology, but won't do much to do so because you've got to deal with the other sources. The sources from lands and waterways, agriculture, forest lands, Erosion from unstable stream corridors. Nonpoint pollution is the challenge in Lake Champlain. The underlying analysis shows that the whole landscape of Champlain Basin and everyone who works, resides, vacations, recreates there contributes to the problem. We're all in it. The new targets require that everyone have to contribute. It's an all-in approach. Um, working in close collaboration with our state colleagues in Vermont, we have built the strategy with them, mostly by them, for meeting our targets. Vermont has made some really hard cutting edge choices to tackle the significant sources of phosphorus. They've included the road network in the plan, including the back roads, the non-paved roads. Um, all of these are significant sources. The Department of uh, the, the Vermont Agency of Transportation has embraced it. I just learned today that the final step towards rulemaking and policy change for the Department of Agriculture in Vermont has been adopted. So we're seeing the actual, um, I'm moving the slides, aren't I? What a distraction. Uh, we, we are seeing the actual um, effect of this plan actually being implemented. We've made a strong and policy case to take the challenges of Lake Champlain head on. Um, and what was very exciting was to see the political system rise too. The thing we did differently there, if somebody asked me, well, why am I talking about this? It's because we engaged early and often with all the actors. We did not sit in Boston and the DEC in Vermont did not sit in their halls. We went out and engaged the farmers, especially the dairy farmers, in a two-year-long conversation about the problem as much as about the solution. So this type of engagement was very effective. Moving quickly, the, the Cape Cod 208, um, and I again want to say unequivocally that this is a partnership, a collaborative effort with the Commonwealth and the Cape Cod Commission. Um, Cape, uh, Cape Cod water quality is declining. It's declining fast. Macroalgae is washing up on beaches. Low dissolved oxygen is plaguing the estuaries. All kinds of issues that affect the quality of the water is, is making a big, big impact on the life on Cape Cod. We have 71 embayment systems slated for TMDL development, including 150 water body segments. This is much of the work of the DEP. Um, some, the needs are daunting. In some places, they would need an 87% reduction in nitrogen load to protect the water, that local water body. Most of it, almost 80% of it, is coming from septic systems. 
So what we need to do is update it, the Cape Cod wastewater management plan. Nitrogen is the issue. Um, fortunately, the Commonwealth gave the Cape Cod Commission three, a little over $3 million, and I, and I was able to stand with them as they went forward in updating their 208 plan. And for those of you who don't remember, 208 is this wonderful planning tool that we somehow stopped using uh, at any, in any detail. Um, we pulled it off the shelf and made it work, and now the 15 Cape Cod communities are responsible for achieving water quality goals under that plan. The Commission's done tremendous things. It's built a very comprehensive IT infrastructure to manage all that's going in to implement the plan. Um, but again, the key there was engagement. Years spent engaging those communities in how to meet the challenges of their problem. You can't talk about the problem enough in terms of getting to a solution. I think that's one of the lessons we've drawn from all of this, is you need to talk about the problem as you talk about solution. Remind people always why we're here, or they, or they somehow disconnect from solving the problem going forward. Um, the other big piece of this that became incredibly important, both through Lake Champlain and TMDL, is the commitment to innovation. And that's difficult for us as government uh, employees to actually embrace risk. We needed to embrace ideas that normally we would say, oh, we, we can't risk the public interest, uh, public interest in that kind of technology. In the Cape, we are. Different technologies are being used, they're being tested, they're being leveraged, their partnerships are coming to them, and it's wonderful to see how people, when they're engaged in the full creative enterprise of solving the problem, they respond and move forward. Obviously, green infrastructure is part of all of this. Um, we have great assets in this region with the New Hampshire Stormwater Center. Um, the innovations I've seen across our watersheds around GI is really important as, as we move forward. So i leave you with this important message in terms of how an EPA region would engage in this kind of problem. First, we must always think about partnerships and getting it done. Well, in fact, we probably were able to clean up Boston Harbor or even Narragansett Bay behind a big court order. Those won't work going forward when you talk about nonpoint. Um, the idea of partnerships, engagement, and problem, problem solving has to be part of it. Second, you need to bring creativity. If you think you can walk in with prescribed solutions and deny the people the opportunity to, to engage in the innovation and creative process of solving a problem, um, at least in New England, you won't get very far because we have a lot of educated, smart people operating at the local level. And then finally, you have to realize that there's lots of assets out there that perhaps we don't always uh, avail, us to, uh, avail ourselves of when we go out and do things. Um, again, there is latent capability, latent uh, creativity. I've seen great things happen. Running a nonprofit organization for as long as I did, I've seen the power of what volunteers and citizen science and, and all the other assets we could mobilize uh, can mean. I'll, I'll leave you with this short vignette. As some of you may know, who come from Rhode Island, it'd be quite a challenge with a conversation about a major port development in Quonset. And when the battle was all over and we'd, we had won the day, I sat down with the folks on the other side, the guy who was hired by the proponents, and, asked, and he, he said, geez, if they'd just given me more money, I would have won. I would have beaten you. I said, no, you, you never would have won because I hadn't started accessing all the assets I had as a at, at Save the Bay in terms of taking on that issue. We were sending committees all over the country to study ports on a volunteer basis. The point is you can get engagement, you can get assets, we can get solutions. And as John pointed out, over 350 years, well, a little less than that, 320 something years, a major city in this area has been created. In the time we have, I know we can make big, big progress on nonpoint pollution, and of course the climate change issue Austin's talked about. Just few minutes ago. So thank you for your time and, and have a good conference. Thank you so much to, to all of our uh, opening remarks speakers. I'd like to just take a few minutes, if that's okay, prior to moving into the next update. Um, five or ten minutes if folks have any questions for, for any of these folks while they're up here um, and before they move on with the rest of their day. So if there are any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Sorry if we can't see everybody from where we are. I think we've got Barry from my Sure, yeah, go right ahead, sir.
Oh, sure. Sure, I'll just re I'll repeat the question as well. Uh, so the question was, as it relates to the Deer Island water, uh, wastewater treatment plant, surrounded by water, what are you guys doing from a climate, per, uh, climate preparedness standpoint? Uh, you're 100% right. Looks very vulnerable, that site, uh, as it was being planned, even bef decades before we had started in earnest on our climate preparedness work, uh, was actually planned to be elevated. Uh, it's actually relatively uh, resilient to some of the stormwater challenges that we would see in sea level rise. Uh, the reason why they had that foresight actually wasn't so much from a, a sea level rise perspective, but uh, from they needed the elevation to get more pressure to get the effluent out into uh, the Massachusetts Bay. But yes, that is a major piece of infrastructure that is surrounded by water, uh, surrounded by the ocean, and something and a big reason why we wanted to work with the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority as part of our planning processes on uh, climate preparedness. All the way in the back, just speak up and maybe say your name as well. What tribal engagement have you guys engaged in, and what roles do tribes play in the projects that you are implementing and your adaptation plans? Well, we, we've had the good fortune to engage with our tribes um, really since, since I took the, took the chair back in seven years ago on all sorts of environmental issues. Um, one we're working in right now is with the Passamaquoddy tribe regarding their wastewater plant and the fact that the um, underpinnings of the plant, it's right on the water, is eroding away. So we've been able to catalyze a federal response, Army Corps, ourselves, others, trying to find money, planning, and time to reinforce um, or make that plant resilient to what is uh, undermining it now. There's other examples, uh, some of it's housing, some of it's environment, but there's a variety of things we're doing, uh, catalytic projects with with our tribes, but it started with a conversation and it's built to actual action. Um, and, and now I think it's a pretty much a feedback loop of action, planning, action, planning, action as we go forward. Any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, um, I'd just like to take the opportunity again to thank John and Austin, Beth and Kurt for taking their time today for joining us. And I know that they've got very busy schedules and some other things to do this afternoon. So thank you again. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite on up um, Linda Hall. She's the chief of the non-point source control branch in EPA's Office of Water. In this capacity, she's responsible for national program oversight of the Clean Water Act Section 319 program and administration of the Coastal Non-Point Source Program. Linda also provides national leadership for other non-point pollution initiatives, including watershed planning, advancing water quality collaborations with USDA and other partners, and supporting the greater adoption of green infrastructure and urban environments. Linda has 30 years of experience in environmental policy, technical and program management, <laughs> about half of those in Clean Water Act programs, including wetlands management, wetlands and water quality assessment, water quality trading programs, and the TMDL program. Linda's, Linda has her undergraduate degree in geography and a graduate degree in environmental sciences. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you all Linda Hall. Talk about Daisy Field. I know. <laughs> I think I can be informative on that. Feel free to take a stretch break here while we try to get the computer working.
video, but I can't get it. It's not showing on the screen. Try the function key. <laughs> Okay, folks, we are going to get started. Please retake your seats. Those of you standing in the back, if you'd like to come forward, there are plenty of great seats right in the first and second rows here. Come on up. Kristen? Kristen? Where'd she go? She took my notes. All right, well, we'll, we'll get started. And um, what a terrific lineup of speakers. Um, we've been warmly welcomed to Boston and to Massachusetts and I think have some great uh, broad context for our next three days. Thank you. And uh, so I am pleased to use the, the time that I have to give you a program level update on the Nonpoint Source Program from where I sit in uh, EPA headquarters. And I uh, look forward to covering a fair amount of material with you here over uh, about half an hour. So um, hang in there, and then we'll have a, a break and, and get into the sessions. But I wanted to start. I was um, very pleased that uh, the planning group was thanked already, and I want to echo that. And I actually want to ask all the members of the planning team for this event to stand up. As Kristen said, we had 40 folks from states, tribes, territories, Nuipik, EPA, planning the sessions, working for the last few months to set up this meeting. So please stand up, and we are going to recognize you and thank you for all your hard work. The agenda looks terrific. I'm, I'm really excited about all the sessions. So I would like to give you an overview of kind of the, the roadmap, if you will, uh, where we've been in the Nonpoint Source Program in the couple of years since we had our national meeting in Dallas, uh, where we are now, where we're headed. And I'm going to focus on um, the following priorities. And uh, as I said, there are quite a few of them. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. But they're all really important to the program. So these are the things we've been working on um, at uh, the national program at EPA headquarters in the regions. We know you folks are working hard every day, day in and day out, to, to make the state, tribal, and territorial nonpoint source programs the best they can be. So we want to do the same thing. We want to support you and make the national nonpoint source program the best it can be. And we've done, um, done a lot of, I, I think, very good things in the last couple of years and, and more to come. So I'm going to give you an update in the following areas that are our programmatic priorities right now. So the first is staying the course on 319 program management and accountability, demonstrating, continuing to demonstrate the return on our 319 investment for, for state and tribal programs. We'll touch on funding, unliquidated obligations, and leveraging, better capturing and communicating our progress. We have a lot of exciting updates there. Improving program operations and efficiency, progress we're making in training and technical support. And then finally, I want to touch on um, the importance of integrating partnering. It's all already been mentioned today. We know that's part and parcel of what we do. So I want to uh, touch on efforts we have underway to integrate and synergize with other 
Clean Water Act programs at EPA, and then with important partnership, federal agency partnerships outside of EPA. So the first one, staying the course on program management. If you've been with the non-point source program for a while, it might be hard for you to believe, as it is for me, that we are entering the fourth fiscal year where the new 319 program and grant guidelines apply. A lot of very good effort has been invested uh, over the last few years in uh, making those guidelines a reality, realigning programs to, to meet the guidelines. And I, so I do thank um, folks in the, the regions and the, the states and territories that are subject to those guidelines for all the work has been done, most notably achieving about a year ago in September 2015 the updating of all of the non-point source management programs. That was a heavy lift. It was a very important goal for us to meet programmatically, and we did meet it. Um, so that's great. And we will um, be continuing to see through. There's been, been a lot of effort, other efforts as well. I won't belabor all of them. But we will certainly, from EPA, continue to see through the implementation of those guidelines. They, they do represent what we think is a foundation for um, very sound investment of the $319, and it's important for us to keep our eye on that. So. We'll be focusing in the following areas in terms of um, making sure we're implementing the, what was envisioned in the guidelines with you know, half of funding going to watershed projects, keeping the management programs updated and, and ensuring they're relevant for, for leading uh, your work in the programs, staying, of course, on um, watershed planning and uh, the review of those plans as set up by the new guidelines and then conducting the annual satisfactory progress reviews and other just important program documentation. So that's something we will continue a focus on going forward. Since much of the urgent focus on program management, the 319 program of you know four or five years ago, was driven by oversight concerns by the Office of Management and Budget, which um, has a big voice in our budget, and uh, the General Accounting Office, I thought I'd offer some perspectives on where things stand with those two oversight agencies. Uh, for with OMB, um, the changes that we put in place in uh, the 2012-13 era, I think, did a lot uh, to uh, re reboot the program in their, in their perspective and to put us on a much stronger footing with OMB. OMB has also um, a very strong interest in the collaboration with USDA, that is the National Water Quality Initiative, and has um, repeatedly expressed its appreciation to the 319 Nonpoint Source Program for its role in supporting that initiative. So um, my sense between both of those things is that um, with OMB we are in good we are in good stead at this point. I think we're a, we're a program in good standing. So that's a very uh, very welcome change from maybe where things were about five years ago. With GAO, um, again, for those that haven't been in the program for, for a while, we had a, uh, an in-depth visit from the General Accounting Office, which is an accountability arm of the federal government. Um, they spent a lot of time looking at the 319 program in the 2011-12 time frame and issued a report that um, asked us to make quite a number of changes. Uh, they, we did get a revisit from GEO, GAO in the last year. So a revisit is when they come back and look at how uh, implementation is going for one of their, their prior engagements um, at headquarters. We spent a fair amount of time responding to various queries that they had and um, grits, pulls from our, our GRITS database and a um, lot of discussion of the steps we had taken from program management. So. It was actually a fair amount of effort, and then in the end, um, and, and we agreed with this, GAO concluded that it was actually too soon to assess the impact of the new 319 grant guidelines, that just given the lag times with lag time with appropriations, grants getting underway, projects getting underway, et cetera, um, we didn't have a, a database of enough projects and enough information in GRITS yet to, to do any kind of an assessment of sort of before and after the guidelines. So, so they uh, deferred for now, but um, we can be sure that they will be back. Um, and just more generally, that as you know, it, as a centerpiece for non-point source work under the Clean Water Act, the 319 program will will continue to be um, the subject of interest and and um, subject to high expectations. So, and we we have no problem with that. We will we will meet those expectations. So take a let's take a look at funding. Uh, this is a, a long-term picture from when 319 funding started, so probably the most relevant part of the graph is the right-hand side. 
For over 12 years, the 319 program enjoyed $200 million or more of funding, and uh, that plummeted very quickly um, in the 2011-12 timeframe to a low of 159 million, excuse me, not thousand million. Um, in FY13, we've climbed a bit up from that. We, our FY16 appropriation was 165 million. We ended up getting that shaved back a bit because of internal rescissions. But um, so we've rebounded a little. We're certainly not at historic levels, and, and where that goes from now is really anyone's guess. So I think it's really uh, in our in our interest just to continue working on um, demonstrating the return for that investment, and that we're managing the funds well. And on funds management, I did want to touch on, on ULOs, on li unliquidated obligations. These are funds that, you know, three, four years, five years after the appropriation year, there's still high levels of old year money on the books. Um, that's not a good situation. That situation tends to be viewed by appropriators and financial overseers at the federal level that, well, you're not spending the money, you don't need the money and certainly the money isn't out on the ground doing good work. So in the past, that was an issue. That was a management problem for the 319 program. So I'm very happy to report we're doing a much, much better job on ULOs. And um, in fact, we just got uh, recent data over the last four years on the national level. The program has continued to cut ULOs by 5 to 11 percent every year uh, beyond the preceding year. So we're really getting towards a sustainable level on ULOs at the national level. We Thank you very much, you know, all you grants managers out there that are doing the due diligence to keep your eye on the funds and make sure funds are getting expended well um, and promptly it really matters and it really pays off. So let's talk a little bit about funds leveraging. So, and this is all kind of on that theme of um, re return, return on the investment. So we all know, um, doing non-point source work, the point was made very well just now. It's a matrix, it's a group of partners, it's a group of funding sources, and, and you pull it together uh, the best you can. And 319 funding can, can play an important role in that. But until recently in the program, we weren't really well situated to, to describe exactly how or you know how much of a role the 319 funding plays. So um, I was really pleased when um, staff at EPA headquarters were able to do an analysis and uh, they looked at 400 of our success stories, non-point source success stories that are, that are reported and um, looked at the state reported funding levels and funding sources for those stories and then did, did an analysis here and I don't know how well you can see this but as you'd expect it's a, it's a diversity of funding, state funding is in the green, uh, local funding in the blue. Red is kind of a collection of other funding, and then yellow is the federal funding. And again, this was all the funding that was reported to, to achieve 400 um, water quality success stories, achievement of water quality standards. So the federal funding, a little less than half of it was 319 funding. So in uh, that green, green gray on the far right, that's the amount of 319 funding that contributed to these overall successes. So, on one level, this isn't very surprising, right? We, you, you all work every day with matrix, matrixing funding. But I think from, from a 319 program perspective, it's very helpful to be able to use an analysis and a graphic like this to show the, the important role 319 funding does play in, um, in making these projects go and, and also that you know, these funds are being very highly leveraged. So um, that's, uh, that's always something that's welcome and uh, I think well received uh, when you're talking about program results. So good work there on, on funds leveraging. We do continue to invest in tribal non-point source programs and they grow every year. About eight tribes per year over the last few years have opted in to join the non-point source program. Tribes receive both base funding and then are eligible to compete every year. For, uh, to plan and implement watershed projects. So just last year, as an example, 29 of 43 such projects were funded. And the second, uh, the next FY17 RFP will be coming soon. We also offer, um, in addition to the you know, ability to attend these national forums, um, regional trainings, usually two to three a year, multi-day tribal non-point source trainings. And um, we have a few of those coming up in the, in the coming year as well. So lots going on with the Tribal Non-Point Source Program. And in addition to the non-point source specific work, 
there are a couple um, pretty important uh, opportunities for tribes under the Clean Water Act just this year. So um, the 303D program just finalized um, the process for uh, welcoming tribes with treatment as a state status, TAS status, for the 303D program for those tribes that want to, uh, through that program, assess and list uh, their impaired waters. Um, that's a program we work very closely with in the Nonpoint Source Program, so there's lots of good connections there. A second uh, opportunity that is um, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that's on the streets right now for comment and discussion, which um, asks whether EPA should promulgate tribal-specific water quality standards, and if so, what those ought to look like. So that's a very important conversation and, and something that could be quite helpful to, to tribal water quality programs as well. So that's kind of our overall frame on you know, funding, our framework for investment, our framework for, for tracking um, the work that's going on in state and tribal programs. I want to move on to talk about um, better capturing and communicating our progress. And this is an area that um, there's been some really exciting work in over the last couple of years. So as you well know, I think most of you, um, the Nonpoint Source Program has uh, collects Nonpoint Source success stories. Um, these are posted on our web page, and they're brief write-ups of the efforts that uh, were made to successfully successfully achieve a water quality standard. So these are very important to our program. They always have been. They always will. Um, we had a banner year. You, I should say, had a banner year in FY16 with with many success stories submitted, and so that cumulative total is up to 675. So. Great job. That's you know that's really terrific. When a program can show um, through non-point source programs, we've we've cleaned up 675 waterways. So that that will continue to be important for us. But many have observed that by over relying or relying only on uh, non-point source success stories as our as our water quality outcome, we do have the potential to sell our program short. Um, because as we all know, it's a long, it's a long, tough slog to get to standards. It can take many, many years. So we wanted an ability to to better capture progress um, and to communicate that progress. So a couple exciting things have happened in that regard. So the first is a um, a change to our measure. So the success stories are associated with measure WQ10. That's an EPA official program measure, which counts an impaired water body that has um, achieved, a, where a water quality standard has been achieved. It's no longer impaired for that parameter. The way that measure was structured, it only captured, so in a, in a waterway that was impaired by more than one thing, it would only capture and count the first water quality standard that was addressed. So if a, a creek was impaired for pathogens and nutrients and work was done to address the pathogen standards were met, that would count as a success story. If continued work happened in that creek, on the nutrients problem and standards were achieved, that would not count the way the me me measure was defined. And there may have been good reasons for it, but over time it was not enabling us to capture all the, all the success that we have. So we did adopt just in this last year um, a new measure. Um, our old measure is WQ10, the new measure is WQ10A. And uh, it basically will accept all of the impairments non-point source impairments that through restoration projects have been restored. And so we are excited about this measure. It's, it's official as of FY17. And um, basically it means that if you do work or you continue to do work in a single water body and achieve subsequent standards, those can be sent in as success stories and those can be counted um, uh, under our official measure. So send them on in. We're, we're ready, we're open for business and ready to take them. Another way that we are working to better communicate our progress. I am very excited to share. It's something we've been, been on our to-do list for a couple of years, and it got published literally last week, and that is a non-point source um, highlights report. That's kind of the, short, the shorthand name for it. National Non-Point Source Program, a Catalyst for Water Quality Improvements. This is um, an engaging and I think very attractive document that serves a number of very important purposes. The first is it really highlights the importance of state, tribal, and territorial non-point source programs and the important role that 319 funds play in supporting them. So that's 
one big thing that it does in a way that um, a number of important audiences can kind of easily grasp. It also portrays the variety of work that we do. A lot of people think 319 and they think agriculture, and that's certainly true in many parts of the country, but we are a very diverse program. Um, you're all dealing with very diverse kinds of problems in, in many different communities, so we try to um, portray a picture of that. It also helps the reader understand how uh, land use drives non-point source programs, uh, problems, I should say. Of course, that's well known by everyone in this room, but as Kurt was saying, you know, less well known by others and an important message to convey. And it talks about, in such a diffuse environment, the importance of watershed planning to get to a result. So it really, for us, I think, communicates a lot of very important foundational messages for us and for the non-point source program. And uh, I think it's going to be a very, very valuable document for us. And I almost forgot to mention my favorite part, which is um, called The Faces of Success. There they are. And uh, the report actually portrays um, a, few, a few folks you know, from, from programs around the country and provides you know, their photo and a brief comment on the importance of the work to them that they are doing and in some of those comments, the role of how the 319 funds helped. But it's really intended to, to put a face on the program and to show that really this is, this is hundreds and really thousands of people working year in and year out on these problems. And, and when you get the water quality restorations, that's truly the tip of the iceberg. So I think there are just many, uh, many important things that this report communicates. And it's, um, it's you know, 16 pages. It's a lot of graphics. So we um, can share it with, you know, certainly incoming senior managers, Office of Management and Budget, General Accounting Office. We have other outreach plans as well. And I think it's going to serve us really well to educate people about non-point source and, and the importance of the program. So I, I hope you enjoy it. There are some hard copies here. We don't have a whole lot of them, but, but certainly you should be able to at least uh, see what it looks like, and we will have some hard copies available, and we'll certainly have it available on the web. And um, I hope you find it useful, as I think we will find it useful. We're, we're going to try to arrange it so that the graphics can be downloaded and used um, by anybody that wants to use them. And you could maybe combine them with your own program-specific information if you wanted to do that kind of outreach. So um, anyway, we're very pleased with that report. And I do want to give a shout out to Sid Curtis. There were a lot of people that worked hard on this report, and I do want to thank everyone. Um, but Sid Cur Curtis at EPA headquarters really saw this thing through for, for two years. So thank you, Sid. Okay, back to our roadmap. We're, we're making our way through. Um, and the next thing, couple things I wanted to talk about is uh, efforts that we have had underway to improve program operations and, and efficiency, and then um, some training and technical support for non-point source staff that we're pretty excited about. So first we will talk about improving operations, and where that starts is with GRIT, or GERTS, depending on what you like to call it. And I'm really pleased to say that we will be pushing out a, a new and refreshed GRIT very soon, um, based on years of you know, user, user input, um, GRIT's issue reports, program changes that we've made, and other imperatives. We've made a pretty large uh, suite of changes to GRITS, and I think they're going to have uh, a lot of benefits and I hope also make life a little easier for you. So it, the changes ought to um, reduce the amount of time that it takes to enter GRITS data, necessary data. There aren't cha changes to the mandatory elements or anything like that, but it should be more efficient um, to enter the data that you need to. As has been requested for a long time, the system will better, um, better allow and support for 319 subgrantees to begin entering project data under a state supervision, st supervision. So again, I hope that will be uh, something that is helpful. The mapping application is much improved. Uh, all of the maps will now be tied to a specific HUC. Um, that wasn't the case in the past, and we got some pretty crazy-looking maps from, for the 319-funded project, so they'll all be, all be tied to an actual HUC now. And in fact, the water body and HUC information in GRITS will now be pulled directly from ATTAINS, which is the assessment TMDL database system. So it's a big step forward in terms of our data systems being able to, to talk to each other. 
Um, so that'll be great in terms of quality control um, on the, the water body information, but it also just sit situates us much better for the future as we head towards an integrated water quality framework and water quality data systems. And it's going to just improve the quality of our data overall. So, so good things coming, and um, it should be out pr pretty soon, I think, certainly within a, a few months, um, you should have a chance to see that new system. We will be doing a GRITS training in 2017 to, to get everyone uh, oriented on the changes, and um, I think that the folks that have seen it in um, demos have, have liked what they've seen, so I hope you do as well. And I do want to take this opportunity to introduce our new GRITS coordinator for those folks who haven't had a chance to meet Adam George. He started with the program about a year ago. Please stand up, Adam. And um, he's our GRITS maven. So you want to talk GRITS, find him at the break. <laughs> All right, moving right along on um, training program operations. One thing that um, I'm, I'm really pleased we're gonna be able to offer at this session for the first time is kind of a, a 319-101, if you will. So as, a, as an ongoing you know, program, grant program, and non-point source program, we have needed for a while um, ba a basic training um, for those who you know, apply for and administer 319 grants. And so uh, I'm very grateful to a cadre of um, regional headquarters folks that uh, work to put together a training for this meeting and we're going to debut it and it's, you know, it's basically gonna be what do you need to know? You know if you're stepping in you know, at a, a state level as a, a grant manager, what do you need to know? What are the key program expectations? What are your obligations in terms of reporting, in terms of you know, GRITS data entry? And to kind of have that all in a, on a 101 training. So quite a few of you signed up for it. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you give us feedback on it because it is the debut uh, of the training. And so we'll be working to refine it and then um, to make it available and in as many ways as we can on a recurring basis. You know, staff come and go. And uh, we want to have that, that training there just readily available so that folks can get up to speed on their responsibilities when they enter the non-point source program. Whoops, I guess I wasn't keeping track of my slides there. The last thing I wanted to mention in terms of um, technical support, uh, something else we're looking forward to getting more fully underway, I guess, in FY17 is something called we're calling the Nonpoint Source Tech Exchange webinar series. Um, we're going to be building on a, a current webinar series that's been more nutrient-focused, but we want to expand it to the full non-point source community to, to all of you, your colleagues, your partners, and it will be primarily on technical topics and, you know, it might be non-point source monitoring design or it might be best practices in uh, drainage water management or um, we've heard a lot uh, already about green infrastructure and how do you know the practice is really working, what are they doing. We've got a fair amount of research on that. We could have webinars on that. So the idea is to have it be a regular forum with useful, relevant technical information for the non-point source community. So we'll be looking to you for ideas. I'm sure we'll be tapping you to be speakers in some of these. We'll, we'll figure out a regular schedule and a, and a lineup and get the information um, out to you on that. So look for more, more on that in the coming months. All right, we are in the home stretch. And here I wanted to just touch on uh, important efforts that are ongoing to, to integrate and synergize with other programs that are closely related to our goals in the non-point source programs. Of course, we touch a lot of programs in implementing non-point source, um, but we have a couple focus areas for integration right now. And the first is with the 303D program. There have been more opportunities in the last few years under the 303D vision with, with less emphasis on um, cranking out large numbers of TMDLs and through the 303D vision, um, focusing, um, taking a more uh, strategic approach to where TMDLs are developed, where other approaches are deployed. And without that, you know, very hectic um, pace driver for TMDLs, there's just been more opportunities to work our programs together. And we've been doing that. We, we had some conversation about that in Dallas, and I know um, folks have continued to work on that in, in various places both in the areas of prioritization, you know, putting joint priorities between the programs, watershed-based plans can serve as alternatives under the 303D uh, 
303 uh, division, so that's a, another area of um, synchronicity as well as just you know, coordinating and, um, implementation approaches more generally. So that work continues. We have a session on that at the meeting. It'll be great to hear um, what folks are doing on that. And then the second thing I wanted to mention as just kind of a, a special focus area is on the area of healthy watersheds and protecting unimpaired waters. The, the 303, uh, 319 guidelines that came out in 2013 kind of made more space uh, for those that wanted to focus on protecting unimpaired waters. The 303 D vision does the same, so that's a good point of connection again with 303 D. Um, but there have been some other exciting things in the healthy watersheds arena as well that have gone on in the last couple years, wanted to make you aware of, and that we'll be continuing to, to implement and track going forward. So the first is, um, that there will be soon, probably in this year, a uh, tool that will be available for anyone in the coterminous United States to get a baseline preliminary healthy watersheds assessment for their waters. Um, this is work that's being done, uh, led up by Doug Norton, which many of you probably know, um, his work on recovery potential screening. And um, so the healthy watersheds preliminary, assess preliminary assessment is kind of the other side of that coin. Um, it's a similar approach, but using indices that are important to um, ecological integrity um, and being an in, in intact um, hydrologic watershed, and then looking also at indices of vulnerability so that you can make an assessment of where are things in good shape, but where might they be vulnerable um, in the near future. So, so that's going to be, I think, a great tool for um, all, all of us to use in, in our water quality programs. And then the second big um, movement in the healthy watersheds arena in the last year was that uh, we did, through EPA Nonpoint Source Branch, give a grant, the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Grant. This is a single umbrella grant to a group. It ended up being the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. So we have a single grant with them, and they will do two things. They are doing two things on um, the first year of the grant. One is to run an annual subgrant process to fund strategic conservation, kind of generally larger scale, longer term protection efforts, and then also to grow the consortium and to, to therefore grow our fairly modest um, federal investment into a larger pot of money for protection projects. So they've done it, they had a great first year. We did get a, a, a round of nine projects in the first cycle. The second RFP is out now. Um, this is the website if you, you wanna take a look and get an update of what's going on or, or put in a proposal. And we were really excited to learn that um, the National, Natural Resources Conservation Service, the USDA, has pledged $1.5 million over the next two years to help fund these protection projects. So, um, and this is through their technical assistance fund. It's not, it's not, equip, um, it's not equip funding or other funding that is um, really limited in how it can be used. So there is um, more flexibility with these funds. So that was a, a terrific boost to the funding that's available. I think we have about $2 million available for, for those protection projects under the grant this year. So exciting happenings there as well. So mentioning NRCS, I did want to touch on a couple quick things with that very important partnership. Um, of course, many, many of you collaborate with NRCS, um, and we consider that a very important um, priority for us as well at EPA headquarters. We have been working over um, the last couple of years to support the National Water Quality Initiative. For folks less familiar with that, that's uh, a focused effort at um, the state level with NRCS um, and State Water Quality Agency to focus on small, typically HUC-12 watersheds, and uh, with the aim of um, saturating or getting a, as high a concentration as possible of water quality focused conservation practices, those that address sediment pathogens or nutrients in those watersheds. There are about 188 watersheds right now. Um, one of the, um, sorry, um, one of the, the things that's been exciting with the NWQI is that in this, um, in FY17, NRCS is, um, well, well, one of the issues where, where the NWQI had been a little less successful in some watersheds was where there had not been watershed plans in place or there wasn't a watershed group or a soil and water conservation district kind of set up to do outreach. And so in those um, situations, they, there just wasn't the participation and there just wasn't the readiness to, to get those kinds of practices on the ground and the intensity that was 
envisioned with the NWQI. So learning from this, NRCS has um, this year started what they're calling the NWQI readiness pilot, and I hope some of you have heard of this by now. The deadline was in September to identify up to 30 watersheds that would be supported in FY17 to complete watershed plans, to complete planning processes, and to do landowner outreach with the idea that then by the beginning of FY18, those watersheds would be primed for a very high level of, of adoption of practices. So it'll be very interesting to see how this pilot plays out. I give NRCS a lot of credit for, for, for taking this on. And um, certainly in the non-point source program where this kind of um, you know, targeting and um, engagement and uh, watershed planning is you know, what we do, it's, it's really encouraging to see, to see things moving in that direction on the NWQI. Another quick note on that, we did do our first report to OMB on NWQI on the short and midterm metrics in 2016, and that was very well received as well. We are doing another one. We have, I think, an inquiry out to some of you for, for information on that. And um, as I've said before, OMB is extremely interested in, in how this um, cross-agency collaboration progresses and, and I think um, inclined to, to support it going forward. And then one last note on uh, an important partnership, turning more to the, the paved places um, and urban landscapes, is one that we have been growing more recently with FEMA. And for those that may not be aware, and, and the Corps of Engineers, but um, for FEMA in particular, they have changed um, policies in a pretty significant way um, recently in the last couple of years to um, adopt much more, um, uh, to, to accept and uh, adopt green infrastructure practices, floodplain restoration, and other soft or green approaches to flood hazard mitigation. So where in the past their, their policies were very much on um, you know, structural readiness and that kind of thing, they've adopted policies that encourage communities to use green infrastructure and similar approaches to, um, to do them in a, a broad enough way that they can actually reduce localized flood risk. So that's a really huge policy shift and it's one that EPA has been um, very involved in and very supportive of, and we've worked on, on various products with them. These are a couple of fact sheets here we did to make sure that, that we at EPA and that communities are aware of these changes. And we've got a couple small pilots going to try to help communities implement these policies, because while they're on the books, they haven't been widely adopted yet. It's a, it's a transition process. So um, that's another partnership that um, is very important to us in the, the urban area of the Nonpoint Source Program, and that we'll be continuing to work on and um, you know, has that connect as well with, with climate resiliency and, and flood resiliency. And on that uh, final note, I will just say, you know, going forward, climate, we've heard a lot about it this morning, um, and we do need as a non-point source program, I think, to, to get more deliberate about thinking about how climate change in the various regions of the country will impact our programs. Um, and also really to understand how we contribute to climate resilience through a lot of our projects as well. And so we'll be focusing on that in the coming year as well. There's a session on Thursday that will we'll kind of kick this off and then after that we will be forming a, a work group. We'll be looking for um, participants for that. Um, but just to, to kind of take a look at what are some of the, the steps we ought to be taking in our non-point source programs to, to make sure we're uh, not blindsided going forward to some of the impacts of climate. So with that, we have actually reached the destination, at least for this presentation. Thanks for your patience. Um, I know it's been a, a lot to, to listen to so far, but um, we are a program on the move. Uh, we will continue to be, and uh, we'll continue to do our best to, to support really what I, what I think is one of the best clean water investments around in the non-point source program. So we'll, we have been busy, and, and we will continue to, to be so to, to support you and your programs. And just before I close out, I did want to say a couple thank yous, which I neglected to say earlier in my remarks. I did thank the planning team, but I wanted to call out in particular um, our host region, Region 1, and Sandra Fanchulo, who has done an extraordinary job to make this the best possible meeting, including uh, a lot of hard work to find uh, this beautiful historic hotel. So I want to thank Sandra personally. 
really, really appreciate it. And I also want to thank Kristen McQuaid, who's done a fabulous job with us, um, with our sponsor, NUIPIC, and also Ann Weinberg um, of uh, EPA headquarters, who has worked very, very hard to make sure all the, all the details are just right on this meeting. All right. And with that, thanks for your attention. I think, do we have time for a couple questions? Okay, we do have time for a few questions, if there are any. The FEMA uh, pilot projects. Um, can you tell yeah. us where those are, are going on? Yeah, and I see Lisa. Lisa Hare back there in the background. Maybe you can raise your hand. I, I want to introduce Lisa Hare, who works in the non-point source branch, and she's been our uh, liaison with FEMA um, when working with um, EPA's Office of Sustainable Communities. So she could probably tell you a little bit more detail about the projects, but one of them's in Region 3 and one's in Region 10. We are hoping to do a couple more in FY17 as well, if we if we get the money. But but Lisa, can you give them just a few updates on the projects? Yes, you were asking uh, where they were. Um, one of them is in uh, um, uh, Ashland, um, um, Washington, and one of them is in Huntington, West Virginia. And this year we have funding to do uh, probably uh, two more. So uh, we sent out some RFPs to the uh, folks in the green infrastructure team, and um, the, we're working that in conjunction and partnership with the Office of Sustainable Communities uh, with their network, and so um, hopefully we'll get uh, two more on board. Thanks. Anyone else? I can. I certainly can. That's true, that's true. Sure, I, I can do that. So um, this is a guidance memo that went out from headquarters probably about a month ago. Uh, in the aftermath of the Gold King mine incident, um, which I'm sure many of you know about uh, and uh, was an EPA action at a site um, under the site remediation program which caused a, a mine breach and um, a major release of polluted water into the local waters and that the ramifications from that are still going on and in the aftermath of that the office of land and environmental management and epa um, realized some things could have gone better in that process and um, took kind of a closer look at its own contingency planning for its site remediation um, projects. And so they have you know, pr processes in place for that. So in a related effort, because 319 funding does, uh, does support mining related projects, we did a, a similar look, although scaled to the, the kinds of projects that 319 supports, um, to look at what kinds of sort of contingency planning and communications ought those projects to have in place, just to make sure if something you know, does happen that uh, the procedures are known, you know who to call, um, the, the equipment's on site if needed. And so actually thanks do go to Region 8 um, for bringing this to our attention early on and also helping a lot in uh, forming the memo that we put together and that um, was issued, as I said, about a month ago. So basically what it says is this, that if you are using 319 funds for projects that are um, you know, the vicinity of abandoned mine lands and are dealing with mining issues, there are a couple steps you need to take. And you need to um, make sure you've got a contingency plan that's appropriate to what you're doing. So a lot of the 319 funded projects that are mining related, are they're in stream treatment. Um, they're not moving piles. They're not, um, you know, they don't have the potential to breach um, ponds and that sort of thing. So we, we would ask that the contingency plans be scaled to, to the activity. But another, you know, so in-stream treatment, that's one set of things. Um, but there are projects funded by 319 that, that do, you know, they're moving stream banks, they're moving piles, and they're getting more into the territory of so something could happen um, during the project. And um, we ought to do due diligence just to make sure we've got the, the procedures in place and communications, lines of communication in place for that. So that's the gist of it. And we're going to track um, with the regions, you know, kind of how, how that's going over the first couple years of implementing those procedures and, and refine them if we need to. All right. Thanks. Okay. One more okay. question before we... Nicole. 
Mm-hmm. How was that memo distributed, and if a state hasn't received a copy of it, how could we go about getting that? We will get it to you. It was sent out to the regions, primarily the regions, so we'll, All right. we'll make sure it gets out. In the interest of time, we are upon our afternoon break now. Thank you, Linda, Thank for that. You. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have our, our break in just a minute, uh, and as part of your break, you have a task to perform. Your icebreaker is going to happen during the break. It's your responsibility during the break to go up to two people that you don't know and find out from them briefly how they came to be involved in the water profession. It might have been a really cool professor. Maybe they played in the creek from the time they were one until they were 10 years old, but during the break, Find at least two people, ask them how they got involved in the water profession, and then you tell them. And when we come back after the break, I'm going to probably randomly call on a few people. So if I see you kind of going like this, you know, hiding under the table, you're the one that's going to get called on. So be aware of that. During the break, two people, how they got involved in the watershed, in the uh, water profession. Uh, also, back by popular demand this year, as we did in Dallas, we have the Name That Tune contest after the break. When you hear the music toward the end of the break, that means you've got about two minutes to get back to your seat. And when everybody gets back to their seat, we'll see if people can name the tune. The songs deal with the coastal zone, primary contact, secondary contact, recreation, uh, first, second, third, fourth, streams, and water as a resource. So they're all water songs. Some are obscure, some are not. We may even have one by a Nobel laureate. So let's take our break right now and be back when you hear the music. Thank you. First of all, who heard the most unusual or interesting way that someone got into the water profession? Who heard, hopefully you remembered your assignment. You heard one of the most interesting or unusual. Now you don't have to give the person's name if you don't want to. But uh, let me give you this microphone. Tell us what you heard. The most interesting one I heard was a woman from Nebraska, Carla, and she got involved in water due to a multi-level marketing scheme called Amway. <laughs> Telling about how, how the, the Amway products didn't have any phosphorus in the water, in, the, in their product, and therefore is better for the water. And she got educated by a wise consumer. Okay, so Amway, responsible for someone here at the conference today. That's a new one for me. Anybody else hear an interesting or unusual way that somebody they met got involved in the water profession? Yeah, scientists, engineers, interesting and unusual, you know. What are we going to say? Anybody have any, any others? Okay, well, I may call on somebody here later on, but we're going to get started with our, our first group of presentations. How about that song? Anybody know the name of that song? Rain, a song about what? Precipitation events, we call them in the business. And who was that song by? What year? The Beatles. 50 years ago, 1966. Written in response to crappy weather in Melbourne, Australia, when they got off the plane. What was on the A side of that single? <laughs> Paperback writer. I looked it up. <laughs> okay, this is uh, session number one, and uh, this session was organized by Peter Monahan and Craig Creeman. Improving Program Effectiveness for State and Tribal 319 Programs. Uh, we're going to highlight nonpoint programs that have instituted improvements to build more effective programs. Uh, presenters identifying new approaches they have included in their management plans. Refinement of milestones, efficiencies in the request for proposals process. Partnership coordination and other activities of the programs where they are efficient and effective. We'll also identify incentives they're using to encourage and accelerate water quality improvements and metrics or other evaluation steps to measure these improvements, programs, efficiencies, and accountability. Uh, the first presenter that we'll have up is 
Alan Benini of the Iowa Department of National, uh, Natural Resources, Public Perceptions of Water Quality at Iowa. Yeah, our corn and our soybeans are natural resources as well. So, well, thank you, um, and and thank you to um, uh, EPA and to Peter for putting this panel together, and a special thank you to uh, our hosts. Um, uh, my wife and I got here yesterday, and it's our first time in Boston. And this is just absolutely the most beautiful city I've ever been to. I love walking around. I love everything. I especially love being an Italian heritage. I love the North End. I could just live there. I could spend the rest of my life in the North End and never, never be uh, dissatisfied. I'd be about 150 more pounds, but that'd be another story. Uh, let me see if I know how to work this room. I mean, wanna... Okay, there we go. I got it. Excellent. Um, Back in 2012, we updated our non-point source management plan in Iowa, and one of the uh, elements of that plan, we had 54 stakeholder groups that helped us build that plan, and one of the elements was that one of the, one of the uh, major uh, goals and objectives was to uh, improve uh, education and outreach to people in Iowa because we had a sense that people really weren't engaged in the water quality um, uh, challenges that we had. And so they came up with a series of recommendations, action steps, um, to help uh, uh, create kind of a uh, an increased awareness and change in behavior uh, of, of everyday Iowans. And the first thing they said was we need to create a baseline. We need to know what, what are people's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about water quality, and then uh, do things to try to affect change in those areas, and then come back and resurvey to see if we've been successful in moving the needle, so to speak. So. In, uh, in, in uh, 2015, after some delays because of distractions by the nutrient uh, strategy development, uh, we were able to uh, uh, retain uh, our uh, uh, University of Northern Iowa uh, uh, Center for uh, Social and Behavioral Research to conduct a statewide survey of Iowans to find out more about what they know or believe or perceive about Iowa water quality. And as I said, the, the purpose of this, the primary purpose was to set the baseline to inform a campaign, a marketing and education campaign, which uh, we hope to embark upon uh, starting this uh, in 2017 to start to shape uh, the future thinking of Iowans as it relates to water and water quality that affects uh, our daily lives. And uh, I'm actually presenting their presentation here, um, so I'm not going to be able to understand or interpret for you a lot of the technical stuff that's on this on this slide, um, because I'm not a, I'm not a social scientist, and I'm not a, a, a surveyor. But they did uh, there was a qualitative component and a quantitative component to the survey. They uh, conducted four, four focus groups, both uh, uh, two of rural uh, of rural Iowans and two of urban Iowans, to get a, a cross section. Of, of feedback from them, and also to test out languaging as it relates to water quality, because the language that we all use in this room is not necessarily the language that someone on the phone is going to understand. If you're just talking to them kind of a cold call and saying, hey, would you mind spending the next 35 minutes on the phone with me and talk to me about your thoughts and, and views on water quality? So they really wanted to test out words and phrases. Um, for example, you know, we know watershed, no one else knows watershed. And they came back to us afterwards and said, do you really need to teach people what a watershed is? Does it really matter? Because they're not understanding it. And you could spend all your time and money trying to teach them what a watershed is and not really affect any change. If you want to change behavior, just have them change behavior. And whatever behavior change they, they do will ultimately impact a watershed in a positive way and will affect water quality in a positive way. So that was a kind of an interesting takeaway as an aside. Uh, they also then conducted a statewide survey. They ended up talking to over 2,000 Iowans, both landlines and cell phones. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they were on the phone for an average of 34 minutes. This was not a quick and dirty survey. People had to really be committed to, to stick on the phone, and, and, and they were able to get 2,080 people to do that. Um, the margin of error of this survey, because of the size of the survey and the success they had in getting people to, pay, uh, to complete the survey, was a, a plus or minus 1.2%. As I said, they had these focus groups first, and, and the first, uh, some of the key takeaways from the focus groups were, first of all, when people are asked about water quality, top of mind for them is drinking water. The average person in Iowa doesn't think of our streams and our lakes and our rivers when we ask about water quality. They're concerned about what's coming out of the tap. Uh, that's, what they're, that's what they're most focused on and most concerned about. So in, in our business, then, that means we have to first get them to shift their mindset from 
the tap water to the uh, source water, if you will. Um, and local geography impacts their perceptions. If they're near a, an important uh, water resource, uh, they're more likely to be attuned to its condition and the challenges that it might face. Uh, there were some differences in urban and rural um, in terms of what are, the, uh, what are the things that are most impacting water quality, yet generally there was a sense that agricultural practices were the leading cause of poor water quality in Iowa, which isn't surprising. We're an agricultural state, um, you know, so it's, it's, not, it's not all that uh, remarkable. And, and recent events influenced their awareness. Um, you know, uh, Iowa has uh, been unfortunate enough to be impacted by a, a number of floods in the last several uh, years, uh, devastating floods, economically devastating floods. And so if you're, in, if you're near or in that area, if you have family that was impacted by that, you're going to be a lot more aware of water quality issues. <clears throat> in terms of the survey itself, the phone survey, uh, they, these were the areas of content that we were focusing on, general, their, their views of the environment and water quality, their general understanding of water quality and the causes of water pollution, um, and uh, behaviors that they're doing themselves and, and whether they're positive or negative as, as, as we know it as it relates to water pro, uh, quality. We wanted to know what are their current behaviors. We don't know what we need to change until we know what they're actually doing. Um, what awarenesses they have in terms of what you can do to change uh, or to improve water quality. Do you really have any understanding at all of what, your, what, your, uh, uh, what options are available to you? And then ultimately who's responsible? Uh, who among all these different constituents groups are responsible for improving water quality? And there's some interesting results there. So first of all, the, uh, the surveyors wanted to test um, uh, whether or not water quality was even an important issue relative to other issues of the day, uh, the economy, crime, school education, you know, uh, our, our roads and bridges uh, was the top one at the time because this survey was conducted the same year that the legislature was debating whether or not to raise the gasoline tax to, to, to give a, a, a new influx of cash to, to rebuild our roads and bridges infrastructure. But as you can see here, that uh, water quality is top of mind. I mean, it, 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 you know, even though we had a lot of floods, it, it wasn't as important uh, flooding as it was water quality. And crime and, 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 and quality of our public schools ranked lower than water quality did in terms of a, an issue of the day. In terms of their perceptions of water quality, though, um, I would say, you know, they're pretty middle road, um, kind of a bell curve here in terms of their perceptions, and that's the key operative here is it's without what they know, it's what they perceive. And uh, perceptions, and that was just water quality in general. Then we also asked questions to drill down in terms of their understanding of water quality as it relates to our, our, our lakes and rivers and streams. And by the way, they also use creeks. They learned from the focus groups that streams is not the word that people use every day in Iowa. They use creeks. So when they asked the survey question, they said creeks, not, river, not streams. I, I, I tend to use streams, so that's what happens when you do this for a living, I guess. But again, we've got a bell curve here in terms of what they perceive as being the current condition of our, of our recreational water bodies across the state of Iowa. So it suggests that there's not a real sense of, oh, you know, the sky is falling. We, don't, we didn't have what we heard earlier about, you know, how, how bad the bay was, I think, in, in, in terms of people's perceptions of Iowa's waters uh, generally across the state. We also then asked them, what are the water, what's the water like now versus 10 years ago? And then what do you think it'll be 10 years from now? And it reflects that same kind of middle road, everything's sort of okay. You know, there's some people are at one end and some people are at the end, but generally people think that, you know, it's okay. Now, when I stopped to think about 10 years ago, that was 2005 it would have been, and our water quality probably wasn't changed much between 2005 and 2015. You know, it'd been nice to ask them what they thought our water quality was 30 years ago versus now, you know, or 20 years ago versus now, and then try to project out 20 or 30 years out. But, but that, that was the limit of, of, of the question. And this was an uncued response, meaning that people, it was an open-ended question. You know, wh what do you think of the sources of water pollution are? And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of information here, but just focusing on, you know, there's, it reinforces what the focus groups found, which is basically agricultural runoff, agricultural chemicals were Uncued is the first thing uh, primarily that came out of people's uh, response to that question. And livestock waste was also mixed in there, but we think it was probably already addressed in a lot of their comments as it related to just general agricultural runoff. Um, what's interesting is lawn care and urban runoff were not perceived by people as being uh, the first thing they thought of when it comes to what, uh, what's the, um, uh, the source of water pollution in the state of Iowa. So there's, it reinforces this recognition within, at least within our rural state 
that it is agricultural rural based uh, challenges that we generally face. The severity of the threats, you know, these, these are the top four here that I've boxed off. We've got livestock waste, you know, industrial and factory waste, cropland, and then dumping of, uh, of chemicals down the drain. Uh, uh, that's what their perception of the threat is uh, to it. Um, and you can see uh, uh, sewage plants and construction sites and lawn and golf courses really aren't perceived by people as being a severe threat in Iowa to, to water quality. Now, whether that, this is actually factually true or not is not important in terms of understanding people's knowledge and perceptions and beliefs about, about a resource issue that we have to communicate. The top five possible um, pollutants that are affecting our waterway, again, this is perceptions, people's perceptions. We can see that nutrients uh, are clearly at the top along with pesticides, and then we have uh, road treatment uh, materials and then bacteria. And we asked, there was 12, it was a list of 12, and this was, you know, where we asked them, do you think it is uh, definitely or not sure, or definitely is not, or you don't think it is uh, a possible pollutant affecting our waterway? And the remaining seven, um, they're still pretty high. I mean, septic systems, petroleum products, uh, various heavy metals and algae still got 50% that say they, they think or they know it's uh, a problem. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, pet waste was not perceived as being a problem. We don't frankly think it is. Um, it's, it's a de minimis amount of the bacteria that's being generated across the landscape. In a state like Iowa, we have 20 to 30 million hogs um, in any given year. Um, now we looked at attitudes toward the threats. Uh, again, uh, their perceptions, their attitudes about it as livestock operations are, are a threat to water quality. Um, interesting, the you know, 61% think we need to increase regulations. Um, this is a pretty sensitive topic in Iowa, as you can well imagine. And yet, you know, two-thirds of the state, uh, nearly two-thirds, thinks that we need to um, increase regulations to address uh, water quality. Um, and um, runoff from paved areas um, is not as much of a problem, but still half of them think it's a, it's a problem. Continuing on about attitudes about how to improve, um, uh, whether you agree or disagree with the following statements. Um, we, talk, we heard it uh, earlier this afternoon from the, from the representatives from Boston, you know, the importance of uh, water as it relates to economic opportunity and economic development and economic growth and strength. Um, the same holds true in Iowa. 85% of the public believes that uh, clean water is needed to maintain and grow our state economy. Um, they also significantly, 80%, 8 out of 10, said that they would be willing to change a behavior to do something to improve uh, water quality. And that's now a challenge for us to figure out what is that behavior or set of behaviors that we can communicate to them to say, if you do this differently, you can, all, you can help us achieve our water quality goals. Um, it's important to our recreation and our tourism. At least that's their, perce their perception, their attitude. We need to increase incentives for farmers. There's a heated debate going on in Iowa right now on whether or not incentives need to be increased and to what extent and what's the contribution from whom to, to address our agricultural runoff problems that we have. Uh, but there's clearly support among the public that was tested in this survey uh, for more incentives for farmers. And interestingly, they say they know what steps they need to take personally to do improvements in water quality. I'm not sure as I'm convinced that they know. They may think that they know. But um, I'm not sure as they really know. I think if I asked 100 people, I'd probably get 85 answers or more that probably weren't going to really do much for us. <clears throat> then we started asking them in terms of behaviors. So fertilizer, you know, it's like often, often the pushback we get from the agricultural community in Iowa is that, you know, well, what about all those lawns and those golf courses putting all that fertilizer on the land? They're putting its rates so much higher than we put on in our agricultural lands. And they don't really pay attention. Um, you know, if one bag of fertilizer is good, then two bags is even better if you've got a pretty green suburban lawn. Well, 40% of Iowans say they don't use any fertilizer. So, um, and we have some scientific data that shows that, that golf courses are actually even more scientific than farmers in terms of applying fertilizer because they, it's, it's, it's an important part of their dynamic of, of keeping their golf courses picture perfect for those golfers out there. Um, picking up pet waste, 80% um, of them say they pick it up. Now, I'm not sure if that's, you know, that might, there might be some, you know, some bias in that answer, but, um, um, but you know, is it worth trying to get that last 20% to pick up the pet waste? Are we going to really achieve the kind of water quality improvements that, that are, that are cost-effective if that's what we go after, if 80% of them truly are uh, telling us that they're picking up their pet waste already? 
Um, 80% use commercial car washes. I've seen some other uh, regional and national surveys, especially in more urban areas, where promoting uh, commercial car washing is, is, a, is a big part of the campaign. I'm not sure that would gain us uh, much in Iowa if we, if we promoted that, you know, given this response. And about half the people are using household hazardous waste pickup programs. The other half are probably just keeping it in their garage. <clears throat> Where do they get their information? This is kind of interesting to us. Local water company. Was, was, was the top of mind for most people in terms of where they get their uh, information or their, or their water works or uh, water utility. Um, and then the media is the second uh, most uh, common source of information. And we were feeling pretty good that DNR came in third. We're the first governmental agency outside of local city government where people go to get information about water quality. Um, and the trustworthiness of those sources. Um, the local conservation board or watershed board was the most trustworthy. And that's important to us because we've been promoting um, watershed management authorities in Iowa and working on a more regionalized basis, which we was heard earlier today as well, to try and promote um, uh, 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 collaboration across the watershed. State governments uh, got in there. We, we didn't do too bad. Um, and uh, there's you guys, for those of you at EPA. Um, so we, we, we out-competed we, we out, uh, our, our brethren at, at, the, at the federal level. and. Um, for those of us who have to deal with some um, rather challenging farm commodity groups uh, messaging at times, um, we like, we'd like the fact that we uh, are more trustworthy than the farm commodity groups in the, in the perceptions of, of, of everyday Iowans. Responsibility for working to improve water quality. The only thing I've got to take away from this is all hands on deck. People of Iowa believe that we all have a role to play. It's not one group's responsibility. They're not saying, federal government, you're not doing it state government, you're not doing it, farmers, you're not doing it. We all should be doing it. And that's an important takeaway in a state like Iowa where you know, we all want to you know, be nice to each other and get along. And we recognize that we all have a role to play. And if we all play our roles, I think we can all achieve the water quality goals that we've set out for ourselves. And how well are various groups actually doing what they're saying that they were going to do? And, um, Local governments are doing the best, which makes sense. I used to work at the local government level, and that's where the rubber meets the road. People, people relate to their local city councils and county governments, and they feel that they're doing the best job at achieving the water quality goals. So the keys to this whole initiative, uh, uh, this survey, in terms of where we're at now as a baseline, most islands, rightly or wrongly, are satisfied with their water quality in their area. Um, and about half, again, feel that things haven't really changed much. They're about the same as they were and will probably stay about the same as they are. There is a clear recognition that agricultural runoff is our major problem and the top threat to our water quality in Iowa. And nutrients um, is clearly uh, number one on the list. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, shared responsibility. Everybody has a role to play and everybody needs to play their role. Um, so that's good. So there's not finger pointing going on. And they're all willing to change behavior. What we need to do now is we've got to figure out what is that behavior or menu of behaviors that we can communicate out to Iowans that they can start embracing to do things differently. I spent about 15 or 20 years in the solid waste and recycling part of, this, of the environmental uh, world. And we did a fairly effective job, I think, of changing people's behavior. People look for the recycling container now when they are you know, at home, at work, at play. 